God bless you. Welcome at every campus. So happy uh, to be here and honored to be here with you. My wife, Jennifer, and I uh, love your pastors. Uh, Pastor Joey and Lauren are such special friends to us, and they inspire us in so many ways. And this is our first time to Philadelphia. We had no idea. The city is so beautiful, so incredible, having an amazing time. Uh, I had my first Philly cheesesteak. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it took me at least 36 hours to recover. I had no idea. Listen, if we had those in Dallas, our team could win. We don't have those. And, and listen, listen, listen. Joey prepped me. When he comes and preaches for me in Texas, he talks so much trash. He talks so much trash. But I know that y'all will cut somebody, so I ain't gonna mess with nobody today up in here. So, uh, But it's, it's awesome to meet each and every one of you. I can't wait uh, to spend time with you the rest, for the rest of the day and tonight. And I'm so excited about the message I'm gonna share with you. Uh, let's pray. We're gonna jump right into it today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you and we give you praise and glory and honor. God, we ask you to speak to us today and to release the power of the Holy Spirit into our lives. God, we put our trust in in you, none of us are here so that we can listen to clever ideas from a human. God, we're all here to hear your voice. Jesus, would you speak today? Amen. Have I said? Amen. Come on. Hey, so uh, one thing that Joey didn't mention to you, Pastor Joey, is that I, I actually, before I became a pastor, I was a professional martial artist. And that's really why he likes to be my friend, because he's a little ornery. I don't know if you haven't noticed or not. He's a little feisty, and, and he, he kind of wants to see me in action. And a few minutes ago, he, he thought about testing me. He thought about it, you know? And, and I, I said, look, if you had done that, I would have done this and this, and you would be dead, and the day's over, and, and you have to find a new... You know, so anyway, I did have a pastor buddy that tried me one time, and I flipped him in his living room. He landed on his face. Uh, so I'm just warning you. I'm just warning you. You know, it's, you know, I got the itch. I have a special gift. I have a special gift, you know. Uh, not many people can inflict bodily harm on their friends and feel no remorse whatsoever. It's a special gift the Lord gives to certain ones of us. No, but today I want to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, and I'm gonna open uh, with this specific verse. Uh, this verse is from 1 Corinthians 13, 13. It says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And this is a verse that's talking about when perfection comes, when uh, the end comes, when Jesus returns, when we enter into heaven, these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love. We understand that God is love, right? All of us know that God is love. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And the Bible talks specifically about how the Holy Spirit is the hope of our eternal salvation. So we see in this passage the three essential parts of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit inside of this passage. And I want to talk to you about hope today in specific specifically about hope being fulfilled. Today is the day of Pentecost, and this is a massive holiday, a huge holiday. In fact, I would venture to say it might be the most important holiday in all of our Christian faith. And I know that's a challenge for some because we think about Christmas, and we celebrate that Jesus came, little baby Jesus came into the world, and we celebrate, and listen, Christmas is hugely important. And then we celebrate Easter, when Jesus rose from the dead, and if he didn't rise from the dead, we would still be dead in our sins. That's massively important. But Pentecost Sunday is when we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus was not done, his work was not finished until the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh. And by the end of the message today, you're going to understand a lot more about that. But I want to start by just painting a similarity for you because this word Pentecost, it literally means 50 days. And in the Jewish tradition, it's called the Feast of Weeks. Pentecost is the 50th day, and it symbolizes this journey. The Israelites were in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. The Passover 
celebration happened and the death angel passed over. All of the firstborn sons in Egypt died that night. Anyone that didn't have the mark of the blood of the lamb upon their door. All of the firstborn of the animals died that night. And the next day, the Israelites left and on a three-day journey, they walked for three days until they got to the Red Sea where they were stuck and Pharaoh was coming in to destroy them and God opened up the Red Sea and they crossed on dry ground and the sea closed in over Pharaoh and all of the army. The entire military power of Egypt was crushed that day and never recovered as a world power. 40 days later, they have walked through the wilderness. They get to the base of Mount Sinai. 40 days later, they Moses goes up onto the mountain. The people while out. They start making golden casts, all that kind of crazy stuff. Moses comes down seven days later with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Three days journey to the Red Sea, 40 days in the wilderness, seven days on the mountaintop is 50 days. Pentecost was the day that Moses brought the word of God, the Torah, the law of God to the people. It's the day that the Jewish people celebrate the giving of the Torah, the most valuable thing that they have. Now watch this. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He died for our sins on Passover. He spent three days in the grave descending to the depths of hell to take the keys. It says he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and he has the keys of those things, the authority over all of those things. And three days later, he rises from the dead. He resurrects from the dead, and he spends 40 days discovering himself or revealing himself, appearing and disappearing and teaching all of his children, uh, all of his disciples, all of the prophecies and all of the things that would happen and then for seven then he ascends into heaven and for seven days his disciples wait in the upper room and on the 50th day the holy spirit is poured out on on flesh are, are you on all flesh are you following me how important because this holiday is the day that we celebrate that the temple of god and where god resides is no longer inside of a building made by man no longer inside of a box the ark of the covenant you now are the temple of the most high God. God dwells in you by his spirit and your heart is the holy of holies. Now we have the word of God written on the tablets of our heart. Y'all, this is a big deal. I know you don't, I know you don't say y'all. You don't know the word y'all. I heard use guys the other day. <laughs> use guys. What's that? Is this like my cousin Vinny up in here? You know, I mean, use guy. We say y'all. Listen, Texas, y'all. We have shirts in Texas that just have Texas in the rest of the United States. It says y'all in, uh, us and y'all is what our shirts say down there. We, we're us and all y'all are y'all, right? But man, in Texas, let me just warn you. I don't know, I don't know what happened uh, a few years ago in the, in the pandemic in Pennsylvania, but in Texas, we bought all the guns and all the ammo. That's what happened. Listen, we're, we love our Bibles. We love our guns and our ammo. And let, let me tell you, Tacos, y'all don't know nothing about real tacos up here. Nothing about, come on, you come see, you come hang out with me. Mm, we'll tell you about some tacos now. I promise. So I wanna talk to you about this thing called hope because the, 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 the day of Pentecost was a day that hope became powerful. And, and this, this verse in the Bible, it talks about how Proverbs 13, that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Have you ever had a longing fulfilled? Can I, can I tell you a story of the first time I saw my wife? I was, I was, I was, I think 20 years old. I had just gotten back from Russia. I was on the USA Taekwondo team. I, I, I had the pleasure of, and the honor of making the USA Taekwondo team and fighting in the world championships. I am a six degree black belt, um, four time world champ, six time national champ. And, and I was, uh, yeah, so that was my career back then. And that's why, you know, no one messes with me at my church. You know, I don't have security. I'm just, playing, I'm just playing. No, we have security. We do. We do. Uh, but but anyway, anyway. No, my security wants to see me in action too. They're like, let's, let's let it. Let's wait a second. Let's see what Joel does. No, but but so I come back and I'm on the USA team and man, I'm on fire, man. I just got done leading a Bible study in in Russia with all the other teams, all the different members of different teams were starting to come to our Bible study. I'm on fire for Jesus, man. And, and I get home and I'm I'm hanging out in my young adults group at my church, man. Listen, if you want to find the woman of God for your life. You better plug into the young adults ministry at Block Church. Let me tell you something, man. I'm walking through, and all of a sudden, I see these blue eyes. 
oh my God, boom, like Cupid, just right in my heart. I'm like, who's that? Girl, man, and that night, man, this is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I grew up in Tulsa, and, and the church I went to was called Church on the Move. We never knew where it was gonna be, kind of like Block Church, man. It's here, it's there, 52 different facilities all over the city. But Church on the Move, and, and, and we, man, I'm telling you, our, our pastor, Willie George, some of y'all maybe remember Willie George and Gospel Bill and all kinds of stuff. You don't know nothing about that, I don't know. But, but we had this camp called Camp Dry Gulch, and they would do these big, what they called Hallelujah Night, because when you live in the Bible Belt, you can't celebrate Halloween. It's Hallelujah Night, man. And you don't dress up like scary stuff, like vampires and demons. You come like you're the fruits of the spirit, like like a, apples or grapes, bunch of grapes or something. You can be an angel, but not a demon. I'm telling. Listen, I grew up in the Bible Belt, y'all. So, so we literally. I'm going to this event. I'm taking some kids from our youth from the Bible study I'm doing to this thing, and I I see that girl. I'm like, there she is, and she's standing next to this dude that I knew. His name was Stefan, and he was this big, tall, studly German dude, man, all just shredded out, man, big blue eye. He was a good-looking dude, and, and she was on a date with him. And I didn't care because I didn't see no rings on them fingers, and I walked right up to Stefan. I'm like, yo, what's up, Stefan? And I'm like, hi, my name's Joel. And, dude, I'm talking, it was like tractor beams, man. If we talked for 45 minutes in front of her date, it was magic, man. The next day, I go back, and I'm like, I'm going to, because they were volunteering. I'm like, I'm going to go volunteer at this event in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I go back to volunteer, and I'm sitting there in this, waiting for all the young adults to show up. We're going to ride out there together, and I'm just hoping, and I'm praying, and the door opens, and in walks Jennifer, and I'm like, yes, Lord, you are good. Hallelujah. And, and, and listen, we ended up working in the hot chocolate booth together. Oh, man. We're just giving out free hot chocolate and they had Alvin they had to bring they had to bring chaperones over cuz man it was like no room for the holy ghost man i mean we were like just tight it was cold and we we're keeping each other warm do you want to see some pictures back when we were i was 20 21 so look at this real quick this is me and Jen she's right here on the front row this is our right we're about to get married here can we see a couple more of those this is man look at this man she she keeps getting better looking i'm just getting heavier and hairier is all i do nowadays right Couple more. This is that's her little brother, right? He's wearing my first karate gi from when I was eleven, uh, right there. This is it's a beautiful thing. What the Lord? Come on, when when God fulfills a hope, oh, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? A longing fulfilled is a, is a tree of life. But what about the hope deferred part, man? Have you ever had some stuff that didn't happen? You ever had some things that don't make sense? See, it could be really easy for you to kind of maybe look at me and judge me and, oh, I bet everything went great for you in your whole life and you probably always did well and you probably whatever, whatever. But man, Jennifer and I have been through some stuff. Uh, see, we, we, we had our first baby and we were, we were doing well. It was like the best time of our lives. And then all of a sudden she's 11 months old and they find a brain tumor. And the tumor was as big as a man's fist inside of her little baby head and it was crushing her brain and she was literally living in agonizing, suffering pain. And our whole world crashed because it wasn't just any tumor, it was called a rhabdoid tumor. It was the most terminal, fatal tumor that they had ever known. And there were zero survivors. And we go into this fight of faith and we're hoping and we're believing and we're holding on to God and we're doing radiation therapy. We're literally shooting radiation through our baby's head. We're, we're having to choke chemotherapy down her throat. It was horrible. I'm poisoning my own kid. Self-administering poison down my baby's throat. They had to cut her head open and, and take this tumor out. And at the end of... At, at her 18th month, she passed. She died. And Jen and, Jen and I were de devastated. Our hope was destroyed. We, 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 we had been fasting and praying and believing for a miracle. And then she died. And I'm telling you, I've never felt more weak. I've never felt more of a loss. I've never felt more hopeless. And my wife and I, we were struggling. And listen, I didn't even know if I believed the Bible anymore. Because I just believed so much that God was going to do this miracle and that it didn't happen. Have you ever had hope deferred? Have you ever been through something horrific, a living nightmare? I have. I have. And what can I tell you? I can tell you that in that place of weakness, the Holy Spirit met me. 
in that place of hopelessness, the hope of God came in my life. And I began to have encounters with the Lord. See, it was in that place of desperation. It was in that place of hopelessness that hope came into my life. And I began to encounter God through the Holy Spirit. I began to have conversations with God. God began to reveal himself to me. I began this practice that I have of journaling, of writing my prayers and asking God to speak to me and writing down what I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me in my heart. And it shifted and changed my life forever. I'm a different human than I would have ever been had I not been through that horrific season. See, sometimes God lets us go through horrible things because he knows what it will produce in us in the future. I would not be who I am today without that. And let me tell you something, my baby girl's fine. She's in heaven and she is healed and she is restored, and she is made new, and I will see her again. And honestly, I'm a little jealous. I wanna be with her now. I would love to be in heaven, wouldn't y'all? Man, I, there's, listen, I prayed, I prayed so hard for Jesus to come back four years ago because I didn't wanna have to live through one more election season in America. My God, it's psycho out there. I want Jesus to come back today, right? Don't, don't wait till November, come back now. Just finish this thing. This world's crazy. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Can I read a couple more verses to you? This is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, and this is Paul speaking, and he said to me, he's talking about his experience with God, when he asked God to deliver him from a horrible situation, he asked God to deliver him from a torment, a demonic tormenting, and God responded, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Hope is is a part of God's eternal nature. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you're literally, literally receiving a portion of God's nature inside of your body to come and live inside of your body by the Holy Spirit. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ, the actual person of Jesus Christ is in heaven sitting next to the, the right hand of the Father. Christ in you is the Holy Spirit in you. It's his actual spirit that lives inside of you. So I want to take you to this moment before Jesus ascended. And this is what people uh, maybe don't quite understand how important the Holy Spirit was to Jesus. This is right after the resurrection. The, the people, the disciples or Jesus' followers are hiding because they've just witnessed Jesus being brutally murdered. They've witnessed him suffering, being beaten, his skin ripped off of his back, crown of thorns on his head. The Bible says that Jesus was marred beyond recognition of of a man. You could not even tell he was human. He was so beaten. We don't understand. Movies cannot do it justice what Jesus went through because he loves you. So they're in this room and they're hiding out because they're afraid for their lives. And all of a sudden, Jesus literally appears in the room. He comes through the wall. He was began to appear and disappear. And every time he would show up, he'd like, don't be afraid. You're like, what? You just like came through a wall. Don't be afraid. What is this? You know? And so he literally says, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to recognize this because the very first priority of Jesus after he rose from the dead was to breathe on his disciples and say, receive the Holy Spirit. The most important thing to Jesus was that his disciples would receive the Holy Spirit. He would go on to command them to, before he ascended, to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit had come and endued them or endowed them with power, filled them 
come with power from on high to be his witnesses. Jesus knew that he had no power except for the Holy Spirit. Did you know Jesus lived for 30 years, never did a single miracle, never did a single act of power, never did anything uh, outstanding besides impressing the scribes when he was 12 years old with his understanding of the Bible and his intellect and his ability to comprehend spiritual things. There's no mention of anything significant happening in his life until he was 30 years old. He's baptized in water by his cousin, John the Baptist, comes out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove and remains and fills him. And then his miracle ministry happens. Jesus tells his disciples, if I couldn't do it without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you can't do it without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You have to have this. Listen, tonight, I'm gonna walk you through and teach you on the baptism of and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I'm literally gonna teach you how to activate the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It is a specialty of mine. It's something that I've done my entire life, my entire ministry. I've prayed with over 7,000 people to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I promise you, if you want the power of God in your life, if you wanna learn how to activate and turn on the power of God in your life, you want the Holy Spirit to come alive inside of you in a powerful supernatural natural way. Do not miss tonight. Five o'clock, Center City. Don't miss tonight. It might be the most important service of your entire life because God's going to come alive in you in an incredible way. Well, Joel, I got plans. Cancel them. But my kids, bring them. But my wife, oh, your wife needs Jesus. Bring her too. Come on. Listen, don't miss tonight. I promise you, if I could preach one last message before I died, what I'm preaching tonight would be that message. Do not miss it. It will absolutely change your life. Be there. Be there. Be there with us. Jesus breathed on them. His number one priority. Do you know how weird that is to breathe on somebody? Yeah, you ever had someone go, hey, does my breath, you're like, oh God, what? Dude, I, I hate bad smells. I, the, the number one best thing about COVID was I lost my sense of bad smell. For six months, I couldn't smell bad smells. Dogs tooting, nope, can't smell it. Trash dump, can't smell it. Bad, B.O., can't smell it. It was, all, the good sense of smell came back after seven days. Six months later, no bad smells is the best thing ever. Oh, I hate bad smells. I, I got a freaky nose. Like, like my, no, my sense of smell is serious business. My wife and I, when we were early married, we went to this little aquarium in Dallas, and, and I said, baby, I smell flamingos. She's like, you are a, an idiot. What? You smell Flamingos, I'm like, baby, I know what a flamingo smells like, and there's a flamingo in this building. She, for, for, for 26 rooms, she made fun of me. And then 27th room, there's a flamingo exhibit. I had such a traumatic experience at the Tulsa Zoo with a flamingo experiment experience when I was a kid. I'll never forget the smell of flamingos. I know exactly what it smells like. And I, listen, so, so, so for me, man, breath, I take very seriously. Listen, I have in my little bag over here, I have a little bottle of peppermint oil. The second I get off that stage, I, will, I have a fear of having preacher breath. Oh, it's the worst. One of my friends went to the altar to get prayed for. The preacher was praying and prophesying over him, laid hands on him. The dude's breath was so bad, my friend faked being slain in the spirit, just fell out in the spirit to get away from it. Not for me. Listen, I'm gonna be preacher breath friendly up in here, right? I, I'm serious about this stuff. I don't go anywhere without cherry chapstick and essential peppermint oil for my breath. This is important for me, all right? So when Jesus like, breathed on them. That's just weird to me. Like, I would never do that. But what was it about? What was the symbolism? The symbolism was the spirit of the living God. See, the Holy Spirit is the hope of our eternal inheritance. It's about God's actual breath coming into your physical body. Look at a couple verses here. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all of the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, it, uh, us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is your guarantee of your eternal salvation. It's the down payment of your eternal salvation. It's your 
expression or your experience, your taste of heaven right now because you have a future in heaven with God and the Holy Spirit is your taste of heaven right now. Romans 15 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know how connected hope and the Holy Spirit were in the Bible? Let me show you one more place. Romans chapter five, five says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Man, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what you may have found yourself in. You may be in a season right now where you can't see your way out of it. You can't see the hope. You can't, and, and you're just holding on to anything you can. Maybe you don't know how you're gonna overcome or get through this financial situation or a health situation or a relationship crisis, but you've got access to the hope of heaven, the Holy Spirit. Man, Jennifer and I didn't know how we were ever gonna make it through the death of our daughter. Did you know that 90% of marriages end in divorce when a child dies? It's a 10% success rate. It is a miracle that this wonderful woman and I are still married. It's a miracle. It's only by the hope of the Holy Spirit that the two of us would, would, despite how different we were and how much we endured that season differently, I wanted to talk about it all the time because I didn't want to lose the memory of her. She didn't want to talk about it at all because it was way too painful. And we had lots of conflict in our life. But the hope of the Holy Spirit, the hope that God could restore us, the hope that God could save us, the hope that God could bring us through. Did you know, did you know today we have two gorgeous daughters, Sydney and O'Neill, 20 and 15. Beautiful, beautiful daughters. God has restored our hope through the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them. Why is that significant? Can I show you this? This is Genesis chapter two, verse seven. This is when God made man. It says, and the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life and man became a living being. When Jesus breathed on his disciples, he was returning them back to the original design, the original plan. It was never God's plan to live in a building. It was always God's plan to live inside of you. It was always God's plan for you to have intense communication, intense intimate relationship with him. That was always his plan. Jesus is called the second Adam, the second Adam. He came to restore everything. When God breathed in this verse in, in Genesis, that word for breath is literally the word for spirit. He put his spirit into Adam. Adam was filled with the spirit of the living God. That's how Adam knew all these different things, was taught by God personally. And God wants that type of relationship with you. The hope of the spirit is God's breath of life. It's possible that you could live your whole life and never come alive. It's possible you could be walking dead. Alive, but not alive. Because you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your life. You've never invited the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And can I tell you that when you get saved, you, the Holy Spirit comes and is with you. In fact, I would even venture to say that before I really converted and gave my life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit was leading me and guiding me and steering me and keeping me alive and keeping me. I shouldn't be alive because of how crazy I lived during a season of my life. Don't even know how I made it home many times and I was the driver. But God kept me alive because he had a purpose and he's got a purpose for you too. And when you ask Jesus to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. But Jesus talked about two different experiences. In fact, when you look in the Bible, you look at the last few hours of Jesus being on the planet before he, was, before he died for our sins. He leaves the Last Supper. This is recorded in John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Those five verses are the, the recollection of John, the apostle, who was one of the closest to Jesus, the only gospel writer who wrote the gospel from the inside. He was on the inner circle of Peter, James, and John, the only insider who wrote the gospel 
who wrote a gospel. And he records the Last Supper conversations. He records the walk from the, from the house where they had the Last Supper th- through, uh, up through across, down through the Kidron Valley, up into the Mount of Olives. He records John 14, 15, 16. You know, the number one thing that Jesus wanted to talk about in John 14, 15, 16, and 17, it was the coming of the Holy Spirit. I'm not gonna leave you like an order. No one else knew what was happening. No, only Jesus knew what was happening in the next hour or two. And he's literally saying, I'm not gonna leave you as an orphan, but the Holy Spirit's gonna come. The helper's gonna come. The counselor, the guide, the the spirit of truth is gonna come. He's gonna lead you and guide you into all truth. He's gonna remind you of everything I ever said. For three, four chapters of the Bible, the number one priority in Jesus's mind was the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the things he said. He said, you have had the Holy Spirit with you. Jesus' disciples had already been casting out demons, laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed, preaching the kingdom and seeing people come to life and do amazing things. He said, you've had the Holy Spirit with you, but you've never had the Holy Spirit in you. Soon, the Holy Spirit will be in you. Can I tell you that there's a, dis- there's a distinct difference? There's a distinct difference. And, and, and listen, tonight, when you come back, We're gonna pray tonight. I'm gonna walk you through the understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna help you see it and so clearly, better than you've ever seen it before potentially. And you're gonna activate the gifts of the Spirit in your life and you're gonna step into a brand new season of your life and experience with Jesus where the power of Jesus comes alive in your life and the gifts of the Spirit are activated in your life where it becomes second nature for you to communicate and connect with God and know the mind of God, know the heart of God, know the voice of God, begin to speak God's word and prophesy God's word and lay hands on people and step into the gifts of power. That's what God wants for you in your life. You cannot fulfill the plan of God for your life to the fullest extent that he has for you without stepping into the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can make it to heaven. This has nothing to do with your destination eternally, but it absolutely has something to do with your journey and how you get there, right? right? I can get all over Philadelphia in a 1974 Dodge. I can get wherever I need to get, Fishtown, Center City, uh, Uptown, Downtown, New Philly, all over. Guys, you guys have so many names for parts of the city. Unbelievable. We have Dallas and we have suburbs, right? It's just, you know, that's what we have, right? And it's just, it's just wild. But I can get all over the place, but that doesn't mean the ride's gonna be great, right? Doesn't mean the car ain't gonna break down sometimes. I'm trying to, yeah, you remember those 1970s cars? You're trying to roll the window up or down, you're like this. Oh my God, my rotator cuff went out. Trying to steer with no power steering, right? Those old, big old, did you guys, man, man, I'm so old. Look, we had driver's ed and we had driver's ed in school. It was part of what we did in school and we would drive these tanks from like the 60s and the 70s and and all kinds of crazy stuff, man. You had to know how to drive for real. Now your cars drive themselves, right? So my point is this, listen, the, the Holy Spirit infilling is an upgraded package. It's an upgraded opportunity. You've got contact and connection to a different power source. You've got access to all kinds of opportunities that are just different. You're still going the same place, but you have a better ride. You have a better encounter, a better experience, and you can walk in authority like you've never understood before.